Okay, it is now 11 a.m. Central Time and we are going to get started. All participants are muted and if you're having any technical difficulties, we recommend disconnecting from the webinar and reconnecting. Um, otherwise, send a message through the chat feature and we will try to assist you. For questions, we ask that you use the Q&A feature on Zoom and we will answer them at the end of the talk. So thank you for joining the ninth virtual resident education lecture series today. Today's topic is cerebral palsy care across the lifespan. We have Dr. Daniel Weber, Adult Epilepsy Division Director at St. Louis University School of Medicine, joining us as our Q&A moderator today. I'm also pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Aravamuthan. Dr. Aravamuthan is an Assistant Professor of Neurology and Pediatric Movement Disorders Specialist, specializing in cerebral palsy at the Washington University School of Medicine and St. Louis Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Aravamuthan, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Allison. Let me start sharing my slides. Okay, so my topic today is a bit of a daunting one. Um, I am going to talk about cerebral palsy care across the lifespan, which is quite a big topic. And so I am eager to hear what everybody thinks about it and what questions may be. I have no relevant disclosures. I'm breaking down this topic into three parts. One, I'll talk about what is cerebral palsy. Next, I'll talk about what I mean by care. And um, that's just a one word that seems very simple, but uh, there's a very particular approach that I would encourage people to apply when caring for a person with CP. And then I'll talk about the value of this across the lifespan. So many people think about cerebral palsy as a pediatric disease, but it's not. Um, people with cerebral palsy or kids with cerebral palsy become adults with cerebral palsy and they still need us. So I'll talk about um, additional considerations to take into account when caring for adults with cerebral palsy. So first, what is cerebral palsy? Uh, CP is um, this consensus definition, and I'm really going to break it down into parts because I think every aspect of this consensus definition is critical to understand. So CP is a lifelong disorder. And just like I said, that means that it's not just a pediatric disorder. It is permanent. It lasts throughout your life. It is non-progressive. So that means that um, uh, the motor disability associated with cerebral palsy, the um, motor manifestations, um, may change over time, but there should not be a degenerative process. So there should be, um, it should overall be non-progressive and any signs of a degenerative process should point you away from a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. It has to have um, motor uh, impact. And importantly, that motor impact has to cause disability. So the concept of function is ingrained into the definition of cerebral palsy. So if you see someone with, um, that you notice has some spasticity, so some mild gastrocnemia spasticity, but they're functioning in their daily life as they um, would like to, they don't experience any disability from that motor manifestation. They by definition do not have cerebral palsy. So assessing the functional impact of the motor, um, symptoms experienced by the person is critical. CP has to be due to a disturbance, and that is a purposefully vague um, word, a disturbance in the developing fetal or infant brain. And it's vague um, for a reason. And that's because cerebral palsy can be caused due to an acquired issue um, in the developing fetal or infant brain or an inherent issue. Really, any sort of um, abnormality in the development of the fetal or infant brain that results in a non-progressive motor disability that is permanent can be cerebral palsy. And lastly, that phrase fetal or infant brain is critical. So we're focusing on issues that happen very early in life. We know that the brain develops over several years, but cerebral palsy is considered um, to be due to a disturbance that happens very on, early on in the fetal or infant brain. Many people say within the first year of life. The impact of CP is high. It is one of the most common disorders that you will see in definitely in pediatric neurology clinic. And it is one of the most common causes of motor disability in adulthood and pediatrics. It is in fact the most common cause of motor disability in children. It affects four out of every thousand children. 
And the costs of CP are quite high. So for every person born with CP in any given year, their lifetime costs are almost $12 billion. And that those costs are medical and medical associated costs. So if you think about the, the medical, societal, and economic impact of CP, all of those impacts are incredibly high. We should also acknowledge the disparities that exist in CP. So it is almost twice as common to have CP in black children compared to um, non-Hispanic white children. The reasons for this disparity, these disparities are diverse and are still in need of further study. So talking about these disparities is important as well. The diagnosis of CP is going through um, an interesting challenge recently um, in the genetic revolution. And as, uh, as I've said, CP is very common. Um, it's something that we all see, but there is still incredible variability even in this very common diagnosis. And we highlighted that in our paper in pediatrics recently, um, in which we surveyed uh, physicians who were interested in CP across Canada and the United States. These physicians um, were all members of the Child Neurology Society or the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine and had indicated in some way a specific interest in the care of people with CP. And we asked them across four hypothetical scenarios, would you diagnose cerebral palsy in these scenarios? And I would ask you, um, as I go through these scenarios, to think about them yourself. Would, would you diagnose cerebral palsy for the hypothetical person in these scenarios? In scenario one, um, there was a five-year-old boy who came to you with complaints of uh, difficulty walking. Uh, the history and um, possible brain injury uh, for him revealed on MRI that he was born premature at 30 weeks. He had a pattern of brain injury typically seen associated with prematurity, periventricular leukomalacia. Um, there was no known genetic cause for these findings. You knew over the course of those first five years that these symptoms had begun in early life and in infancy and had not been progressive. And you also knew on exam that he had elevated tone. He had spasticity in both of his legs. So that was um, the first scenario that we thought of as almost a slam dunk or classic CP scenario. Then we asked um, people about a second scenario, which was identical to the first, except in this scenario, the child had progressive um, symptoms. So very clearly did not have um, motor symptoms early in life and in infancy, and then newly developed those motor symptoms with regression of milestones around the time he was three or four years old. So um, we saw that as almost a negative control. We thought that most people would say that this um, hypothetical child would not have CP because of the progressive component. Next, we asked um, again about a scenario relatively identical to the first, in fact, identical to the first, except there was a genetic cause, a known genetic cause identified um, to explain, that would explain the brain injury pattern and motor disability seen in the child, in the hypothetical child in scenario three. And the last scenario was very different from the others. This child had no evidence of brain injury, was born at term, had an identified genetic cause, and had diffuse low tone as the cause of their motor disability, um, but again, had no progression. So the responses in some ways were expected and in some ways weren't. So in scenario one, the majority of people would diagnose cerebral palsy. And this is kind of the classic CP scenario that I described to you. In scenario two, um, the majority would not diagnose cerebral palsy, the vast majority. And that is what we expect, given that this child had a clearly progressive phenotype. In scenario three, now mind you, this scenario is identical to the first. The only difference is that there was a genetic cause identified. Significantly fewer physicians would diagnose this child with cerebral palsy. And the last scenario, even fewer would diagnose that child with cerebral palsy. And I'll remind you that in both scenarios three and four, these children had a non-progressive motor disability that was identified early in life and could ostensibly be due to a disturbance in the developing fetal or infant brain. So they otherwise did meet criteria for cerebral palsy. When we asked practitioners why they would not diagnose CP in scenarios three or four, 40% said they wouldn't diagnose CP in the setting of a genetic etiology. And, in a, and a separate 12% said they would not diagnose CP in the setting of pure hypotonia. And the reasons for this um, are interesting. Uh, but first, um, what is the validity of this? 
So etiology, many physicians currently diagnose CP based on etiology. And um, even though I didn't include this phrase when I was describing cerebral palsy to you earlier, that is explicitly contraindicated in the consensus statements. Cerebral palsy is a clinical and not etiologic diagnosis, meaning that you should be allowed to give a CP diagnosis regardless of the person's etiology, as long as the time window of that etiology makes sense. So as long as that disturbance happens in the developing fetal or infant brain. And next, physicians also seem to diagnose CP based on tone type, um, with many suggesting that pure hypotonia as a cause of motor disability should exclude a CP diagnosis. And there is some debate here amongst the uh, consensus statements detailing the definitions of CP. So for example, in um, European cerebral palsy registries, uh, children with pure hypotonia are excluded, um, but that is not the case for other cerebral palsy registries like in Australia. And the reasons for this are historic. Um, historically, cerebral palsy was defined based on the presence of high tone, often spasticity, but as our understanding of cerebral palsy evolves and the um, various contributions to, our, to what cerebral palsy is evolves, this question of tone has also um, come under ongoing debate and ongoing hot debate. So first let's focus on etiology. What does it mean when physicians currently diagnose CP based on etiology? And here are some example physician viewpoints explaining why they um, would diagnose based on etiology. With a specific genetic diagnosis or syndrome, this would be the more appropriate diagnosis. And these are direct quotes from our survey. Another physician said cerebral palsy is a bad term. Patient has a known genetic disorder. And last, I guess the general neurologist would call it CP, but given my genetics training, I feel that it is too much of a bucket diagnosis. So over and over again, you see this concept that if you have a more specific diagnosis or an etiologically descriptive diagnosis, that that is going to be better than a broad clinical descriptor like cerebral palsy. So we asked people affected by CP and their caregivers the same question. Is that true? Do they prefer having a specific etiologic diagnosis as opposed to or instead of this broad CP diagnosis? And we surveyed about 200 people across the US and Canada again. We recruited them through two um, patient power registries, through two registries um, that uh, variably included just people with CP or people with neurodevelopmental disorders that had a genetic etiology. And amongst that group, we then mined for the people with CP. And when we asked them this question um, about etiology and CP diagnosis, 75% of people affected with CP and their caregivers valued knowing the cause of CP and the majority preferred carrying both diagnoses together. So almost 70% preferred carrying a CP diagnosis together with an etiologic diagnosis, not having one supplant the other. And when we ask people why, um, what, are, what value does having a CP diagnosis provide to you? What value does having an etiologic diagnosis provide to you? And we asked across several domains, um, understanding the evolution of your symptoms, being able to explain your symptoms to others, including other medical practitioners, access to services, and access to a community that really understood your needs um, and the needs of uh, your child. We saw that across these cases, um, people felt that a cerebral palsy diagnosis provided these uh, features to them more than a etiologic diagnosis. And it was more frequent to see that. So another thing in support of um, having a CP diagnosis given together with an etiologic diagnosis and not having that more specific diagnosis supplant the CP diagnosis. I have a, a quite a long community viewpoint quote here in full because I think it explains why um, people with CP and their caregivers might feel this way and does so in quite an eloquent way. And I'm going to read it. The genetic diagnosis is what caused the cerebral palsy, which is important information, but it does not describe the person's condition. Not everyone with the same genetic diagnosis has the same symptoms. They go on to say, the genetic diagnosis is rare and not many people, even medical professionals may be familiar with it. So cerebral palsy is a term that most people understand. And lastly, a CP diagnosis will allow the patient to get more resources, such as funding for equipment and therapy. So if you go over the aspects of these quotes and then go back to this bar chart, 
you see that every aspect of this bar chart is explained quite nicely in this quote from this community member. And it just, again, supports the idea that cerebral palsy um, should be viewed as a clinical diagnosis that is given separately from an etiologic diagnosis. And in this context, I think it's important to think about CP in, um, in association with its neurodevelopmental disorder cousins, like epilepsy and autism. And we know that all of these disorders go hand in hand. Um, there are high rates of epilepsy and high rates of autism in people with CP, and it warrants screening for those disorders. When we think about epilepsy and autism diagnoses, we do think of them as clinical diagnoses, and we say it's epilepsy due to this genetic mutation or autism in the context of this genetic mutation. We should say the same thing about CP. CP should also be viewed in the same way. CP is due to this genetic mutation or this etiology. And then when we think about um, the, the descriptions of epilepsy and autism, when you say someone has epilepsy, you very clearly describe seizure semiologies associated with that. When you say someone has autism, you describe the impact on their function. In fact, it's a, it's a required diagnostic item in the DSM-5 criteria. So we should be doing the same thing with CP. And I think it's really important to view CP in this context. If we can do this with epilepsy and autism, we should be able to do this with CP and we should be viewing CP diagnosis in that way. So I want to pause here to talk about um, what is a CP mimic? So this phrase has been thrown around uh, quite a bit in the literature recently, and what is a genetic cause of CP? And um, many people might think that if you have a genetic cause of CP, that it automatically is shuttled into being a mimic. And, and that's not the case because CP is a clinical diagnosis. So a CP mimic might be someone who may have met CP criteria in early life, initially appeared to have a non-progressive phenotype, let's say first couple years of life, but then eventually that disorder reveals itself to be degenerative and progressive throughout childhood. So in that case, even though they may have seemed to have CP early in life, they eventually revealed themselves to not have CP. What they had was a CP mimic. A genetic cause of CP is different. So that means you do have true, true CP, non-progressive throughout your childhood, but that there is a genetic explanation for why you have that CP. And that distinction is critical. So a genetic cause does not exclude a CP diagnosis, but there are some genetic etiologies of motor dysfunction that can, um, uh, that can affect uh, whether you, there are some genetic etiologies of motor dysfunction that mean that you don't have CP that are progressive or degenerative. So with that said, what should you do in terms of making a CP diagnosis? So thinking about diagnostics, imaging is important. Um, everybody should have an MRI if possible to help investigate the injury pattern associated with their CP. But um, especially for young children or, ch or people with respiratory issues, the need for sedation should be taken into account. And if there is a um, clear story to explain why someone has CP, if the history makes sense and the history associated with the phenotype makes sense, so a child born premature who has spastic diplegia, for example, um, you may choose to delay the MRI uh, pending the need for sedation. So you can still give a CP diagnosis without uh, having an MRI in hand, although the concept of needing an MRI should stay in the back of your mind. And when the risk benefit ratio weighs in the favor of getting an MRI, at that point, getting an MRI can be useful. Consideration of genetic testing. So um, we're learning more and more that the genetic contributions to CP are quite significant. So up to 30% uh, of people with CP can have some sort of genetic contributor. And um, that means that when you think about sending genetic testing, um, who do we send it on? In my practice, I think about a mismatch between history, phenotype, and imaging pattern. So if a child is born um, at 33 weeks, has a relatively benign NICU course, but has significant spastic quadriplegic CP and their MRI is relatively benign, that doesn't quite fit. The phenotype does not fit with the history and the imaging. That child deserves a genetic evaluation. If you have a child with PVL on MRI and spastic diplegia, but they were born at term, they have no history of any sort of um, uh, um, 
abnormalities during the pregnancy or during the delivery, went home with mom, then the history does not match with the phenotype or the imaging pattern. And that child should also be considered for genetic testing. So keeping these three features in mind and thinking about do they all make sense together is important when considering what the etiology of CP could be. And identifying that etiology is important. It's important to the community because they wanna know that person with CP and their caregiver wants to know. And it's also important to think about screening for comorbidities um, and potential treatment options, and also family planning, both for the parents of that child and for the person with CP in the future. And then lastly, once you've done all of these investigations, in the note and to the family, you should be able to describe what the cause of their CP is. Again, because people have said they want to know, that's what our data shows, but also because it should guide um, future diagnostics and the ongoing diagnostic odyssey to be able to get that person with CP and their family what they need to know about why they have CP. And that includes sharing information that you have CP based on clinical diagnosis, but we don't know why. And here's what we're going to do to figure that out. Sharing that uncertainty is something that's desired by the community as well. And I would encourage everybody listening to this um, lecture to do that with their patients also. So we've talked about etiology extensively. Practitioners also seem to diagnose CP based on tone type, um, meaning that certain tone types are more or less likely when seen in a person to be um, associated with receiving a CP diagnosis. With regards to tone type, um, it can be very difficult to think about that in the concept of uh, giving a CP diagnosis, uh, in part because we are pushing for earlier and earlier CP diagnosis because early treatment is valuable um, for uh, lifelong improvement in motor disability. So based on this excellent systematic review, um, we are now pushing to diagnose CP as early as possible, including less than a year of age. And that is possible to do for children with known risk factors for CP, like prematurity or term hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or neonatal infection. Uh, children that you know have a disturbance to the fetal or infant brain, you should be able to have high vigilance for CP, use imaging and standardized motor exam techniques, and be able to confer a CP diagnosis as early as less than a year of age. The problem with tone typing here is that it's hard to phenotype um, children with CP in general, people with CP in general, because they often have a mix of different tones. And so if we're supposed to be providing a CP diagnosis at less than a year of age, um, how do we motor phenotype that child accurately? That takes a lot of skill. And this is additionally important because children that have a predominantly dystonic motor phenotype um, at less than two years of age are more likely to have a cerebral palsy mimic or lose, lose a cerebral palsy diagnosis as is put in this paper from the Canadian Cerebral Palsy Registry. So identifying what tone types a child has may clue you in to whether or not they have true CP or a CP mimic. And so identifying these tone types are important. And because it's difficult and because it's so important, we advocate for early referral to a neurologist to diagnose CP. And we um, described the rationale for this in neurology last year. There is a clear gap um, in this area in terms of tone type identification. And we've shown that only 30% of children at high risk for cerebral palsy, so these are kids that theoretically should all be getting a CP diagnosis at less than a year of age, only 30% of them have their tone types identified by the time they're five. And this is a problem and also an opportunity because um, not from just a diagnostic standpoint, when we talked about earlier as a dystonia predominant phenotype, making it more likely that you have a CP mimic, but also from a treatment standpoint, because CP mimics are often treatable and that's why identifying them early is valuable, um, in large part because treating them early tends to lead to better outcomes. So noting these tone types early, um, having that clue you into the presence of a CP mimic and identifying that treatment early is really critical. And even in people that don't have CP mimics, even in people that have true CP, Identifying and treating dystonia early can be valuable because we know that the earlier you treat dystonia, the more likely it is to respond to treatment. So thinking about this overall, thinking about tone types in CP, identifying them early, 
is really critical for CP care. Um, as I mentioned before, this can be difficult because people with CP have mixed tone. So they have often a combination of axial hypotonia, so trunk and neck low tone, and appendicular hypertonia. And that's almost always a mix of spasticity and dystonia. So there's data from um, uh, Darcy Failing's group in Toronto that up to 80% of people with spasticity have some degree of dystonia. So almost all people with CP have some degree of mixed tone. Um, the last type of hypertonia that we think of is rigidity. And it is uh, extremely rare, in fact, almost never seen in um, true, true CP. Rigidity is um, a red flag for a CP mimic, typically an infantile onset neurotransmitter disorder. And if you see this in a child, if you identify this type early, it should automatically shuttle you into thinking that this child has a CP mimic and to pursue investigations and potential early treatment for that. When we think about identifying these hypertonia types, um, spasticity and rigidity uh, tend to be relatively straightforward in terms of um, the exam features you need to elicit to identify them. So for both, if you have passive stretch at a joint and change your velocity of the passive stretch, for spasticity, you'll get increased velocity or increased hypertonicity with increased velocity of passive stretch. So that's the catch. Spasticity is also typically associated with hyperreflexia. Um, rigidity, you don't get that increased hypertonicity. You have stable tone with different velocities of passive stretch. So it is um, relatively straightforward, not simple, but straightforward to understand conceptually what spasticity and rigidity are in terms of exam maneuvers. Uh, dystonia is kind of its own thing. So dystonia is a little bit more difficult to identify. And when we think about diagnosing dystonia in people with CP, um, the, the value of it, I cannot overstate. So we talked about why diagnosing dystonia early matters, um, both for a diagnosis, identification of mimics, and because treating dystonia early um, is better overall. Um, it's easier to treat dystonia early compared to later. It's more treatment responsive. But also because treatments for spasticity and dystonia are different. Um, baclofen, which is typically our number one medication that we try for tone, one of the first medications we try, does work for both. But clonidine, gabapentin, those are classically dystonia-focused medications, don't work that well for spasticity. Um, very early on in a child's course with CP, you might consider a surgical treatment called selective dorsal rhizotomy, which I'll talk about later. And dystonia is a relative contraindication for selective dorsal rhizotomy. And many of these children um, would get referred at less than age five to get this surgery done. So if you have not properly identified who has spasticity as their main form of um, their main contributor to motor disability and who has dystonia as their main contributor to motor disability, um, the treatment paths you take uh, can be significantly influenced. So diagnosing this early is very critical. Dystonia um, is triggered by unintentional movements. So now we're moving away from um, the exam maneuver of um, passive stretch at a joint. You're doing some of it as observation. You're doing some of it by examining how you trigger the person's movements. And you're doing some of it based on history. So a person with dystonia will have unintentional movements that are triggered by voluntary movements, by um, heightened arousal, so by stress, by excitement, um, or also triggered by touch. So when someone handles them to um, during transfers, for example. And because of that, because of these triggered aspects to these movements, there is incredible variability over um, the course of the day. And dystonia tends to not be present at all with sleep. So asking families about this, is your child very loose when they're asleep? Do they go floppy when they're asleep? Are they... Um, tight during the day? Does the way they're tight change over the course of the day? That can be valuable to cluing you in about dystonia. Additionally, what we found, and, and we're doing work to kind of characterize um, how, people, how people with CP and their caregivers describe their own dystonia. Even though we tend to think of dystonia as, as a form of high tone, um, and we tend to think of these twisting postures, sustained twisting postures as um, hypertonic, People with CP and their caregivers tend to view them as predominantly unintentional movements, extra movements that occur out of their control, not necessarily as high tone or tightness, which they tend to think of more as describing their spasticity. 
um, asking families if if you or your child moves one part of their body, does a different part of their body move without them meaning to? Um, we found uh, and people have responded and, the, and our preliminary data shows that questions like this might be better for cluing you into whether or not someone has dystonia in the context of their CP. And you can view this on exam. You can look for voluntary triggered ab, um, unintentional movements on exam. You can look to see if um, a transfer triggers unintentional movements in the person or if their excitement or they're starting to talk to you triggers unintentional movements. Um, but you can also ask about all of these in history. And the, the child in the clinic room, the person with CP in the clinic room is in an unnatural situation for them. And it's often a, a 30 minute to you know, one hour visit during which you have a lot to focus on and that person um, is undergoing a lot of stress being outside of their natural environment. So thinking about the, the qualities of their movement in their typical day-to-day -day life and asking about that can be really valuable to cluing you in as to whether or not they have dystonia. So thinking about all of these diagnostic aspects, diagnosing types of tone, um, uh, diagnosing whether someone has CP at all, figuring out the etiology. Once you've done all that, how do you care for the person with cerebral palsy? So um, care for people with CP, I think should focus on, on three things predominantly. One is that it should be function focused. So anything you do to someone, anything you do for someone should be in the interest of advancing their functional goals. It should be comprehensive. So we tend to think about CP um, as, as neurologists. I'm a movement disorder specialist, so maybe in particular me. I tend to think about CP primarily in the context of, of motor manifestations. But CP is a systemic disorder. Um, all aspects of the body tend to be affected. The initial brain injury um, or brain disturbance affects um, all aspects of this person's function. And so even if we're focused on optimizing motor function, all of the other aspects affected by CP should be taken into account because everything sort of works together. And lastly, because CP care has to be comprehensive in order to improve someone's function or, or maximize or optimize their function, it has to be multidisciplinary. So first I wanna focus on what I mean by function. And um, whenever I see a person in clinic with CP, um, I first explain what the CP clinic is, um, how, our, how we're a multidisciplinary clinic and who you'll be seeing. But then the first thing I ask them are, what are the goals for your child or for yourself? And this, is, this can be a heavy question. Um, people have not, not all people have been asked this question. So not all people have had the opportunity um, to respond uh, to, to have developed a response for this question. So um, I always start with it, but sometimes it can be overwhelming for families to say um, what the functional goals are for their child or overwhelming for the person with CP to say. Um, a lot of the time people can say just off the top of their head. So uh, it's important to ask, and then you can kind of walk people through um, what they want their functional goals to be. Separate questions you can ask separate from what are the functional goals for your child is what is the main activity of your daily life that you wish could be a bit easier? And you can give examples like um, toileting, transfers, bathing. Um, what aspects of daily life, getting around school, uh, could, we, could we help make easier so that your life and your overall function is optimized? And then um, another way to ask this question, maybe in a more directed way for people um, that maybe this is the first time someone has asked them this set of questions or this is the first time they're really thinking about this, is what, are the, what is the next milestone you're most excited to achieve with your therapist? And um, if our therapists are great at thinking about functional goals and thinking about next steps, but asking families and asking people with CP, which of those goals do you really most want to achieve uh, we as practitioners can help them achieve that goal, and that can be used as um, a springboard for understanding what their overall functional goals are. So example answers to these questions. Um, what is uh, the functional goal for you or your child with CP? Um, getting around independently, very common functional goal. 
Um, what activity of daily living do you feel, um, if we could just make it a little bit easier, could dramatically improve um, overall quality of life? It is shocking how many people cite diaper changing, just the tone issues that impair being able to um, help someone with CP who's maybe significantly more functionally affected toilet or change their diaper, very commonly cited goal in clinic. Um, and then another goal, again, very commonly cited, um, the, the joy and quality of life that being able to eat brings you um, cannot be underestimated. And um, very commonly, caregivers feel that that's a core part of their identities, being able to feel, feed their child. So um, we see this stated quite commonly too. The thing I'm most excited about that I'm working with speech is being, or with feeding therapy, is being able to safely take tastes of food. So I'm um, working on oral motor skills and oral motor coordination. So these are very common things that people will have cited in our clinic. And I think you'll be surprised, um, I often am, at what the caregiver or the person with CP's goals are and what I would guess that their goals are, uh, they often don't align. They often don't align. So asking people what their goals are is really important. Um, you don't wanna be treating something that's not going to improve that person's quality of life. So you should first assess what they think is gonna improve their quality of life. There are uh, five functional classification systems established for CP. Um, and these all are on a level of one to five. Um, and they uh, describe function across gross motor, fine motor or manual ability, communication, eating, drinking, and vision. Um, I'm not going to go over all of these classification systems now, but suffice it to say there are excellent resources online to talk about the value of these classification systems and how to apply them. This is an infographic from Seek Freaks, which I just think really beautifully puts all five classification systems on one poster. And um, I, I still refer to this when I'm thinking about uh, classification system levels for the people I see in clinics. So I'd encourage you to find, use this resource or find a similar resource. I'm going to focus a little bit on GMFCS. This is the, uh, the original functional classification system that was developed for CP. And we tend to think of CP, um, its predominant effects being in the gross motor domain. Um, so I, I want to make sure that everybody comes away with at least an understanding of GMFCS. Um, GMFCS is graded based on um, uh, the person's ability to independently get around. So um, levels one and two are this person is able to independently ambulate. Uh, the difference between one and two is that um, a person at level two needs to hold on to railings to get up the stairs where a person at level one does not. People at level three need um, some sort of uh, equipment to be able to get around. Um, so often use walkers or canes. People at level four um, are able to get around, um, but uh, primarily um, maybe using a wheelchair and can use a motorized wheelchair to get around. And people at level five um, are able to get around with the assistance of others. So understanding these levels can be valuable both for just kind of internalizing the gross motor functional level of the person you're seeing, but also for other reasons. For example, the surveillance guidelines for um, hip surveillance are based on GMFCS levels. People at higher GMFCS levels, so with more gross motor functional limitation, need more frequent screening. Um, this is uh, an infographic taken from the AACPDM care pathways. Uh, there are several, including for dystonia, hypotonia, early identification of CP. Um, I would encourage everybody to go to the Care Pathways website and look at the Care Pathways that are available. They're all um, expert consensus um, based on uh, the literature, beautifully done Care Pathways, and are excellent ways to guide care of our people with CP. Now, when we think about gross motor management um, in the context of function and in the context of functional goals, um, how do we think about that practically? So um, when I think about this, I think, okay, so there are lots of, lots of treatments available to affect someone's gross motor function. How do I best use these treatments to help this person achieve their functional goal? Not how do I best reduce their spasticity? How do I best reduce their dystonia? How do I best increase the range of motion? No, it's how do I achieve this person's functional goals? How do I work with them to do that? And here are a range of management options. Um, 
the medication options that I typically use um, for uh, spasticity are going to be baclofen and clobazam, perhaps other benzodiazepines. For dystonia, you can use options two through five, baclofen, clonidine, gabapentin, clobazam. Trihexyphenidyl or artane, I have here asterisk. Um, it is uh, still a commonly used medication for dystonia, but we do have emerging information that um, in most cases of children with CP, the risk benefit for Artane um, tends to favor the risk side. So we are tending to move away from using Artane at least first line for dystonia. It's often a second or third line medication. Botulinum toxin there I have listed first. The first question I tend to ask myself about gross motor management is, can this person's functional goals be achieved with focal tone reduction or do they need global tone reduction? And if the answer is focal, um, botulinum toxin is the way to go. Um, less systemic side effects overall. And um, if you can achieve that the necessary tone reduction with that sort of focal injection, it makes sense to do that. You can use it for both spasticity and dystonia. All of these treatments, um, both toxin and medication, significantly benefit from the use of orthotics and physical and occupational therapies on top of that. Um, the orthotics you can use include things like benic hand splints to keep your hands open, supinator straps to make sure that pronator spasticity is compensated for, um, benic vests for people with low axial tones, neck collars for people with low um, neck tone, and in the legs, things like AFOs, ankle foot orthoses that come up above the ankle, um, SMOs, supramalleolar orthoses that come just above the ankle, things like foot inserts to help correct um, inversion, eversion abnormalities with gait, and then other things like knee immobilizers for people that have um, problems extending their legs fully due to tone. So um, that's quite the word soup <laughs> of orthotics. Um, this again focuses on the need for multidisciplinary care. Um, if we alone were responsible for deciding what orthotics people with CP needed, it would just, it would be too much. And I think we should rely on the expertise of our colleagues here. So working together with um, physical therapists and occupational therapists as a team is really helpful in, in selecting the right orthotics to achieve a person's functional goals. Um, lastly, I'll talk about surgical interventions. So orthopedic surgeries and neurosurgeries, both um, valuable treatment options, particularly for people that have been refractory to these other um, options, toxin and medication-based options. Um, people with contractures, no amount of medication is going to be able to treat a contracture, so um, tendon releases can be really helpful. Osteotomies, definitely in the realm of orthope the orthopedic surgeons to decide who would be the best candidate for these. These are often done in the context of severe um, hip dislocation, hip subluxation. Neurosurgical interventions, who to refer and when is still up for debate. Selective dorsal rhizotomy is um, a surgery that is reserved specifically for people that have spasticity as the primary component and some would say exclusive component of their functional limitations. It was originally offered for people um, with relatively minimal functional impairment. So we're talking about people at GMFCS two to three um, who needed slight amount of tone reduction to be able to achieve their best um, their best ability to ambulate independently. Now it's also being used in um, a, perhaps a more palliative fashion for people at higher GMFCS levels to reduce um, the medication burden and Botox burden needed to reduce some of the spasticity in their legs. Um, selective dorsal rhizotomy is uh, typically done in the lower lumbar roots. It is um, selectively cutting certain dorsal rootlets to reduce the sensory driven hyperreflexia feedback loop that results in, um, that can contribute to spasticity in the legs. Intrathecal baclofen can be done for both spasticity and dystonia. For spasticity, it tends to be focused on spastic diplegia and is again done um, along the lumbar levels. For uh, dystonia, it uh, can be done at the C-spine level with the thought that baclofen diffusing through the frame and magnum and then into the brain is what results in um, decreased dystonia. The idea for intrathecal baclofen is that the oral bioavailability for baclofen has a certain limit and that um, intrathecal baclofen increases the delivery, allows you to increase the dose of baclofen delivery for tone management issues. 
Lastly, deep brain stimulation is emerging as a, um, a valuable uh, a treatment option for people with dystonia as their predominant concern with cerebral palsy. The um, outcomes for this are variable based on um, the people you select for it and based on what their functional goals are. Again, thinking about whether the person has um, the kind of CP the person has and whether their functional goals would be met by deep brain surgery, deep brain stimulation surgery is important. So discussing those at extent at centers that do deep brain stimulation is critical. This is not an option that's for everybody. Um, it's an option for people that are that are medication refractive, refractory, that have um, intact uh, globus pallidus GPI um, uh, on their MRIs and that have a clearly defined functional goal that they think can be achieved with deep brain stimulation. So um, discussing these with practitioners that are involved in assessing for deep brain stimulation and performing the DBS um, surgery is important. So with all of these things available to you, how do you apply them in a function-focused manner? So um, this is a, just a hypothetical um, person. So you're seeing this person in clinic, a seven-year-old girl with CP, was born premature. Um, this is a, a very gross overview of different um, functional levels um, that this girl experiences, this girl that you're seeing experiences. So she is um, more significantly limited with gross motor, fine motor, and eating and drinking ability. You see that the levels are four to five there. Um, her vision communication ability, she's, she's quite a bit less limited. So uses, she uses an eye gaze device pretty effectively to communicate, although is um, a little bit slower to communicate than other people. She's able to communicate well. So this gives you an idea of um, the general areas in which function optimization um, could be effective for her. So we're focusing on gross motor, fine motor, eating and drinking. And when you think about the motor exam for her, you see that she has um, what may be a classic motor exam for people with CP that you might see. She has axial hypotonia. Her head is hanging, but she can lift it. She has um, pretty limited movement of her left arm such that she doesn't really use it very much at all. But her right arm, she has significant spasticity and dystonia that you notice on exam. And she has a mix of dystonia and spasticity in her legs as well. And just touching her legs triggers scissoring, triggers dystonic scissoring. And she also has scissoring and toe pointing that's spastic at baseline. So um, when we think about function focus management for this person, uh, you can see how dramatically your treatment plan may change depending on what the family describes as their functional goal. And these were just three of the functional goals we talked about earlier, three example functional goals. So for this person, if a goal for her was getting around independently, um, we may predominantly focus on her arm so that she can operate a motorized wheelchair instead of having to be pushed around by someone else in a manual wheelchair. So uh, that means that we're thinking about Botox to that arm. We're thinking about sensory reinforcement techniques, maybe with the compression sleeve to help her um, uh, perhaps overcome some of that dystonic movement she's seeing in that arm. We're thinking about dystonia medications like clonidine, gabapentin, um, and thinking less about heavy generalized tone medications that might make her head hang down and have her give her a more difficult time seeing where she's going when she's moving around in the wheelchair if she's slumped over. So if getting around independently is her functional goal, the treatment is focused towards dystonia and spasticity in the arm. If the functional goal for her is helping with toileting and diaper changing, then all of our um, treatment focus or the main treatment focus is on the scissoring. So we're thinking about um, adductor Botox. Uh, we're thinking about um, uh, improving range of motion in those legs. So how are we keeping those legs apart when she's sleeping? Um, we might consider a, a palliative SDR in this person to help reduce some of that lower leg tone. Um, we might consider intrathecal baclofen in this person. So thinking about these aspects, if this is her goal, then all of a sudden our treatment is now focused on her legs. And then if the main focus is for her to be able to safely take taste of food, if she can achieve the functional goals she wants in one and two, but she really wants to be able to taste food and do that safely, um, we might think about uh, assessing how much she's drooling. Should we do Botox to her salivary glands? 
Um, does she have a neck collar that fits that allows her to hold her head upright? Does she have a Benic vest that fits that allows her to hold her trunk upright to be able to safely eat? So these are the things that um, we would change uh, dramatically based on functional goal. So this isn't just lip service. It's not just something nice to say. What you do for a person changes based on what your understanding of their goals are. So again, if you take nothing else away from this talk, make sure that when you see someone with CP, you take the time to establish what their goals are. So we've talked about function in terms of care. Um, it's also important to make sure that care is comprehensive and multidisciplinary. Now, this part of this lecture could take an hour or weeks in and of itself, but I want to focus on what I mean by that. Um, this is the main consensus definition that I paraphrased earlier in the talk about CP being a permanent non-progressive motor disability due to a disturbance in the developing fetal or infant brain. Um, one of the key and beautiful aspects of this consensus definition that I left out was this. Um, CP is often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, communication, behavior, epilepsy, and secondary MSK problems. So um, again, CP is a, is a systemic disorder, and it's up to us to, to improve motor function, um, or to put it another way, motor function is not an island in this person. Uh, improving the other aspects of their function will help you achieve your goal as a, as a movement disorder specialist or as a neurologist focused on CP of improving motor function. So um, a way to think about this specifically in the context of motor function is when we think about motor function, how do we improve it to optimize your mobility, which we talked about earlier, your communication. So an example of this would be um, if someone um, has a, um, uh, need to use a communication device, um, but needs to be able, and that's an iPad device that involves pushing a button on a screen, um, that means that, and, and if that's their main goal, to use that handheld iPad device for communication, that means that you focus your motor treatment plan on improving their motor coordination in their arms and in their hands in order to be able to use the iPad device. So that's what I mean by improving motor function in order to optimize communication. Um, a separate concept could be if their goal is to use an eye gaze device, um, thinking about how you can improve eye function to um, optimize their ability to use communication devices. And then eating and drinking, we talked about an example of this earlier. How do you improve axial tone issues to be able to improve someone's eating and drinking abilities? Or separately, if someone is trying to use utensils to, for eating and drinking, how do you improve hand function, arm function? So tailoring your treatment that way matters. But you can only tailor your treatment that way if you know what someone is currently doing for communication, if you know what someone is currently doing for eating and drinking. So when I say think about CP in a comprehensive way, I don't mean that we as neurologists have to be in charge of their feed schedule or the type of formula they get, or that we have to pick the, the iPad device or the eye gaze device. But it does mean that whatever we're treating them for has to be optimized to these other features that our colleagues are working on. So um, it's important for us to know too. So we need to be able to ask all of these questions in a clinic. Um, next, so we talked about how to optimize motor function to improve um, those other communication, eating and drinking and mobility. The other aspect of thinking about comprehensive care is how do we improve these aspects of your care so that we can improve your motor function. Um, for example, if someone isn't sleeping well, it, you should work on improving their sleep regardless. But if someone isn't getting any sleep, they're definitely not gonna be able to engage in therapies during the day if, um, and they're not going to be able to achieve their best mobility. So um, thinking about sleep um, in the context of the medications you prescribe for motor function and also in the context of just improving sleep overall is valuable. Thinking about sleep studies, do they have sleep apnea? Do they need their tonsils out if they're kids? Um, can you double count a medication for both tone and sleep like clonidine? That can be valuable. Um, attention and behavior is a common concern in people with CP. Autism is also very common in people with CP. Being able to recognize those as um, risks for people with CP, refer them to the appropriate therapy services in the case of autism. And for attention, being able to um, give them the treatments they need to, again, help optimize their ability to interact at school and with therapists can 
help you achieve your goal if you're primarily focused on motor function. You have to assess attention in order to be able to achieve that person, help that person achieve their optimal motor function. Um, pain, every person with CP should be asked about pain. Um, most people with CP experience it. Uh, it is present, chronic pain is present in over 60% of people with CP. And it is often a significant functional limiter. So when you're thinking about motor function, um, improving it to help improve pain and thinking about improving pain to help motor function is also, are both important. So it's important to ask um, because you can't have one without the other. You can't improve one without improving the other. And last, epilepsy. So epilepsy is very common in people with CP. Um, it's important to screen for seizures, meaning asking people if there's been cognitive regression, asking people if there have been episodes of, um, of uh, um, uh, sudden staring or episodes of um, mouth automatisms or episodes of intermittent shaking that could or could not, that may or may not be seizures um, can be important. Screening for this and asking people if there are concerns for seizures is critical because again, treating seizures can improve overall function, which can again improve motor function. So lastly, in these last few minutes, I wanna talk about care across the lifespan. Um, the impact of CP is lifelong. So um, one in three people will have a loss of mobility. Um, the majority of people will have chronic fatigue the majority of people will experience chronic pain. And this matters to all of you because children with CP become adults with CP. So um, again, this is not just a pediatric disorder. It matters diagnostically because many um, adults with CP may have missed the genetic revolution. So they may still not know the etiology of their CP or their CP um, diagnosis may have been given when they were very young and it may actually be a mimic. So making sure that CP diagnosis is a true diagnosis in the adult is important. And lastly, because of new neuro neurologic concerns that adults with CP may have, and this was work done with um, Sarah Smith, who's seen here. Um, the new neurologic concerns include, include twice the risk of stroke and eight times the risk of spinal cord injury. So seeing a person with CP who's lost mobility, that's not just, oh, they have CP and they can't move as well anymore. It could be that they have a new neurologic issue. And so ongoing surveillance is really critical. Um, and we have described this in a, in a paper that we published in Annals last year, including this infographic. I would encourage you all to look at it um, and to think about it when you see adults with CP, both on an inpatient and outpatient basis. Um, we also include in that paper a table of um, what to screen for, both re with regards to motor screening um, and cognitive screening, and also um, in terms of epilepsy management. And we have that provided both for um, neurologists, researchers, and for adults affected with BICP. Um, and the reason we wanted to do this is because we think there is an underrepresentation in our field in neurologists. Uh, in, as a part of the care team for adults with CP. And that's a problem because adults with CP continue to have ongoing neurologic concerns and new neurologic concerns. So we're really a critical aspect of their care. So with all of that said, um, I'd like to acknowledge the multiple people that I work with, um, both in the clinic and in the lab uh, to help advance care for CP. My main focus, if you didn't guess during the talk, was on dystonia with CP, but um, thinking about CP across the lifespan, um, both with regards to dystonia and um, outside of that is so critical. I would encourage all of you to uh, view the people with CP you see in clinic in, um, in a comprehensive care way and in a function-focused care way. And I promise the treatment outcomes that you'll get working with people with CP in that way will far um, exceed anything that you would get not looking at it that way. Uh, thank you very much.